Hey everyone, uncharacteristic for strong medicine, I've got a quick hot take for today's video. There was big COVID related news here in the US this afternoon. The FDA granted emergency use authorization for convalescent plasma. So I'm gonna talk about what convalescent plasma is, how it works, what the evidence is, and whether this is good or not such good news. In brief, Plasma is the liquid part of blood with red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets all removed, but with circulating proteins still present. The circulating proteins include coagulation factors, which is why plasma transfusion is a common treatment for patients with coagulation disorders when they're also bleeding. But plasma also contains antibodies, which are proteins produced by the immune system to tag microbes to be attacked and removed by one of several mechanisms. Convalescent plasma refers to plasma from an individual who has recovered from an infection in whom there are circulating antibodies specifically against that infection. With COVID, the idea is to take antibody-rich plasma from a COVID survivor and infuse that into a patient who is actively infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus to give that person's immune process a head start on fighting the infection, since it could take many days or even weeks for the body's immune system to begin to synthesize its own anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. And luckily, there is enough consistency between different people's immune systems that antibodies produced by one individual can trigger the appropriate response from the immune system of a different individual. Convalescent plasma is a relatively low-tech treatment that's been around for literally a hundred years. It's been tried on everything from Spanish flu to Ebola. But although it sounds great, is simple to prepare, and relative to some other treatments is on the inexpensive side, it doesn't necessarily work. In fact, for most diseases, it has minimal to no benefit. And until now, it has not been considered standard of care for any commonly encountered infections. So with COVID, where do we stand with the evidence? You would think that an emergency use authorization from the FDA would be based on something substantial, right? Well, maybe in pre-COVID times, that would be the case. But as we saw with hydroxychloroquine, this FDA during these times, it, it doesn't require definitive evidence. Convalescent plasma has been given to about 100,000 Americans already yet there is no peer-reviewed RCT demonstrating effectiveness. Up until now, what we've had has been just some small observational studies that show promise. What the, FDA has, has claimed, what the FDA has claimed today's decision is based upon is a week-old preprint of an open-labeled study of 35,000 patients who had received convalescent plasma in which their outcomes were analyzed based on when in the course of their illness they had received it and whether the plasma had relatively high or relatively low titers of immunoglobulins. Here's the main summary of their results, particularly figure D. Patients who received plasma within three days of illness onset had a 30-day mortality ranging from 20 to 28%, depending on titer levels, and if they received it later than three days into their illness, they had a 30-day mortality ranging from 27 to 30%. Overall, mortality if given within three days was 22%, and if given after three days, it was 27%. Now, if we're being generous, this would suggest a 5% absolute risk reduction. So if 100 patients uh, hospitalized with COVID were given convalescent plasma, five of them would live because of receiving the plasma. Although 5% mortality benefit may not sound huge, it's actually really significant for a medical intervention, and it's certainly better than the lack of proven mortality benefit with remdesivir. So why might I be kind of skeptical about this? Well, first, first of all, there's the study design. It was not blinded, it was not randomized, it was not controlled. There's no placebo here. All 35,000 patients got some type of plasma, and there are a ton of confounders not the least of which is the fact that these patients were enrolled in all kinds of overlapping experimental trials of other anti-COVID therapies. Some of these other experimental therapies, such as remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine, were adjusted for, but others were not even reported. 
these other overlapping trials, which are a huge problem in COVID clinical research in general, they might not even be known to the investigators. Giving an unproven treatment to tens of thousands of patients and then analyzing and presenting this kind of data as if it should carry the same weight as a well-designed RCT is ridiculous. And to be honest, it is an indictment of the entire scientific community that a large RCT of a promising, widely used intervention has not yet been performed. I'm honestly not trying to disparage the authors of this particular preprint here. This was not an easy thing to have accomplished during a pandemic, and they deserve some credit. But the limitation section of the paper, to be honest, it reads like a list of excuses about why their study design was so suboptimal. Now, let me discuss my reaction to the FDA announcement today. Uh, put simply, I'm incredibly disappointed. It's not that I think convalescent plasma is snake oil. I, along with many, many physicians, think the theory and observational data is promising enough to suspect it is probably beneficial to some extent. But there is not enough evidence to say that we know it is, and there's not enough evidence to justify today's emergency use authorization. So why are they doing this? I don't think it's a stretch to speculate that the FDA was pressured by the White House. Consider this absurd tweet of Trump's from just Saturday, claiming the FDA is part of the mythical deep state, deliberately, uh, deliberately holding back on therapeutics until after election day. And there's the timing here, with Biden coming off a successful Democratic convention, the Republican convention about to start, and the leak of the very embarrassing audio recordings of Trump's sister giving her rather frank assessment of our nation's president. But the timing aside, you might still ask, what's the problem here? If I'm saying that convalescent plasma probably works, isn't it a good idea to get patients better access to it, irrespective of potential White House interference? Well, there are three big problems. First is the decision itself. As I said, we don't actually know for certain it works. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's generally not an effective strategy for combating infections. Just last week, after the aforementioned preprint was, was uh, released, Anthony Fauci said that there was not enough data to move forward with convalescent plasma. There's, there's been no new data since then. Nothing has changed. Uh, in fact, I love this disclaimer on the preprint itself that was still present today after the FDA announcement. This new medical research has yet to be evaluated and so should not be used to guide clinical practice. You don't say. And now because the FDA has given it a stamp of approval, as a supposedly effective treatment, it may become even harder to enroll patients in a proper RCT because who wants to risk being randomized to a placebo when they could get Wonder Plasma? In other words, we may never know if convalescent plasma is effective in COVID. And are our collective memories so short that we don't remember what happened when the FDA was pressured by the White House to provide emergency use authorization for hydroxychloroquine? The government stockpiled millions of doses at taxpayer expense, and many, many thousands of people were treated, only to later learn that the medication was, at best, ineffective, resulting in the FDA revoking their decision. Who knows how many people were harmed because of that? The second problem was how the decision was announced. The FDA cherry-picked what stats they focused on, and they pushed the relative risk reduction from convalescent plasma from, from convalescent plasma rather than focusing on the absolute risk reduction. Now, I'm not going to get into the difference here. It's easy to find uh, with Google. It explained relatively well. But in short, the only reason to focus on relative risk reduction is to deliberately deceive the audience into thinking an intervention was more effective than it really was. This kind of deception with statistics is absolutely not unique to this specific situation. It's, it's a very common thing in medicine, and uh, it drives me crazy. But a particularly bizarre part of the announcement is that some of those involved, including the FDA Commissioner Steve Hahn himself, they don't seem to even understand the difference between these first-year medical school concepts. The third problem is how the decision was made. As I said before, it strongly looks to have been uh, made under pressure from the White House based on politics rather than on science. Now, whether or not you support them, 
there is no denying the fact that Trump is currently heading towards a loss in November's election. To improve his chances, he very much needs a win on the COVID front, or at the very least, needs a scapegoat in the FDA if a major COVID breakthrough does not happen. The net result of this is a disintegration of the trust that both the public and clinicians have in the FDA. So if the FDA announces a vaccine approval in a few months, are we actually going to believe it's effective and safe? And what if the vaccine is approved, quote-unquote, under emergency use authorization rather than through the proper pathway following a robust and completed phase 3 clinical trial? After this convalescent plasma affair, on top of the hydroxychloroquine fiasco, I'm going to be more skeptical of any decisions made by the FDA regarding COVID. And to be honest, it makes me really angry to say that. So anyway, that's all I have for today. Like I said, this is just a strong medicine hot take. So, you know, grain of salt and all that. Maybe after a few days, there will be more data and analysis that will change my thoughts about it. I, I certainly hope there is. Um, if so, I'll post an update. If you see no update, you can assume that I have not changed my mind. Anyway, stay safe, particularly those affected by forest fires or hurricanes this week, and be on the lookout for an upcoming video about COVID and school reopenings.